How's it going, guys? Welcome to Blue Shifting, and welcome back to Seabed. Uh, Alright, I'm going to just jump right in. I kind of had some brain farts last episode. I had, so I'm going to jump into the comment first thing first, because we need to talk about that before we get into the main plot of today's episode. Uh, so, a Little Magi pointed out, because I'm an idiot, he says, uh, I'm confused why you think it was Sachiko and Takiko in that tip. That was a tip from the last part. That CG was clearly Lily, not nice aunt. So she did the last episode talking about her friend that her friend disappeared after losing her daughter. And here we learn she meant that her friend lost all her memories. And the, and then that last episode we saw more where Sachiko could simply went away as well if she joined Takako. Yeah. I'm an idiot. I think I was kind of overwhelmed with still the thoughts about Dr. Narsaki not being real. And just everything that was happening. So yeah, I totally brain farted there. You're absolutely right. Um, apparently the memory loss thing was affecting Lily in her past as much as it was affecting anyone else. Um, and that was what she was referring to. And it was absolutely her. We even saw her. I looked at her. I was like, who is that? Because I'm an idiot. <laughs> so. Uh, oh, well. Yeah, well, but here we are. And maybe that explains a lot about why Lily likes to travel. Because, like, so she is, like... It's interesting because it's like Lily and her friend had very similar like experiences and uh, like like lifestyles as Sachiko and Takako, where they were best friends who loved to travel. Uh, one of them like lost their memories and was lost effectively to just life in general, and then the one who was left behind kind of had to figure out what was going on and to try and deal with it, and even like. Had, she had very strong, almost hallucinatory experiences herself, where she imagined her friend sitting next to her on the bus and talking to her, but that was mostly just her kind of remembering, rather than literally seeing her friend, from what I can tell. <sighs> but anyway. Anyway, so, uh, we, we, go, we covered all that, and Sachiko kind of had a moment, well, I think she was saying, she, having her official goodbye with Dr. Nasaki, where... They had a conversation next to the furnace. I think the in the furnace, like, 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 there's a moment where she's like wondered if she, like had a feeling of loss. I think the doll was thrown into the furnace. I think Dr. Narsaki like influenced her to get rid of it as part of like getting rid of her. Then they, she went up to the bedroom. They fell asleep, and Dr. Narsaki left. And I think she's gone now to leave Sachiko to heal. So let's see what happens. I start going around the mansion, entering at, his, at, at emerging in its front entrance. Upon reaching the parking lot, I spotted an old Japanese bike in the shade of the trees. There's not a single car in sight, though. Are you looking for something? As I began looking around, Nanae suddenly appeared from beyond the front, open front doors. I'm looking for Narasaki. Yeah, here we go. Um, who? You haven't seen her? You're the first person I've met today. I see. I heard the grandfather clock in the lobby strike the hour. If you're not in a hurry, how about we have lunch together? I looked up at the sky. There were no clouds, only some dry, warm sunlight. Okay. Nana and I looked out the windows, we enjoyed our post meal coffee. There's not a single cloud in the sky today. Looks like a sunburn waiting to happen. I've heard the sun is more potent in the mountains. Is that true? The ultraviolet rays apparently get stronger here because the atmosphere is thinner. But don't worry, I come well prepared. Yeah, I mean, it's technically true, but like, it's very minimal from what I understand. I mean, I grew up, I, I grew up and lived in a higher atmosphere at altitude. And to be honest, I think the sun was more dangerous in the lower climates when it was warmer. Uh, but like, so like there's technically more atmosphere, but the difference in atmosphere uh, based on elevation, because like, I believe I lived at like a mile high elevation versus like, like, uh, sea, no, what's that about? Oh, what's it called? It's uh, sea level. Gosh darn it. <laughs> so I lived about a mile in elevation, um, in the plateaus. I don't know. I don't think it was super noticeable. Like maybe if you go onto the top of like a really tall, tall mountain peak, um, that's when it could become like probably more noticeable. But that's like, you're talking about miles and miles above sea level. Most people don't live high enough for that to be a problem. Let's see, anyway, uh, the atmosphere is thinner, but don't worry, I come well prepared. Look! Nana rolled up her sleeves and showed me her white forearm. I've got some homemade sunscreen. Wanna try it? 
Thanks. But I've brought my own, so I'm okay. If you say so. Then I shifted her position, knowing her arms. I turned to the window to see her combing her front hair with her, in the reflection. Hmm. I wonder what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. I was thinking of going hiking. That's that's nice. I wait. Is that such a good? I I can't tell who's talking. Let's see. I think okay. I think Sachiko is the one who said that first because she turned to respond. So I think. I wonder what the weather's going to be tomorrow. I was thinking of going hiking. That's nice. Should be clear weather tomorrow. Do you want to come? I do, but I'm not sure if I can make it. Nana hid her hands from behind her back and made a deeply sad face. She explained that she had participated in a local inn proprietary meeting tomorrow from early, from the early morning. Is that why you went? Is this why you were looking for this Narasaki person? I nodded. Yes, she's an old friend. Can you tell me what she looks like? I'll tell her about your plans if I see her. Well, she's a tall woman with red hair. Her mannerisms and speech might come off a bit masculine, I guess. Okay, got it. If you see her, tell her I was looking for her. I'll do that. Um, are you sure you don't know her? She was staying here. We're closed right now. I thought I had already told you. That's right, you, you did. Yeah, the cafeteria door suddenly opened. Yeah, Lily, the only person we actually thought we saw talking to her, so. I'm sorry, did I intrude? Lily stood in the entrance. Not really. Nana, can you come here for a spell? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've gotta go. Okay, just leave the place here. Okay. Now I apologized to me and stood up. Sorry for interrupting you in the middle. Sorry for interrupting you in the middle of conversation. That's okay. That's okay. But I thought we agreed you wouldn't call me Nana in front of people. We, we did. I could hear a bit of their conversation beyond the door. Yeah, yeah. That it's uh, it's all coming apart finally. I finished my cold coffee and brought up the cup to the kitchen along with Nana's. I stood there for a few moments when I suddenly heard a ringing sound. I walk towards its source. Oh, come on, Sachiko, your whole your whole reality is gonna start crumbling around you because you're gonna realize what's happening. I let the cafeteria get into the lobby. Big black and somewhat antique looking telephone on the counter was ringing. Hmm. So it's all kind of coming together now. Come on, Sachiko, put it together. You gotta realize what's going on. And Narasaki. Why are we- How is she still round? I looked at the sea beyond the window. The rays of the setting sun painted an interior of the train car in orange. Clank, clank. The train car rocked back and forth as it trapped along the rails. I opened my eyes and looked around. Row seats lined each wall of the car. An old woman and a girl, likely her grandchild, sat further away from me on the same long seat. The child was kneeling on the seat, looking out the window. The old woman looked at the scenery from the corner of her eye. Her thin hand resting on her knees she had a golden watch on its wrist. In front of me sat a middle-aged man in a suit, reading a black notebook. A little bit further away, a high school girl in her uniform had nodded off. That's good. I heard a brief fragment of the conversation two clerks were having nearby. You've chosen the right woman. She's smarter and works harder. The other man nodded. I'll admit, her being a beauty played a role when I chose her, but I was mostly attracted to her smarts. I still sometimes feel like a child around her. Sounds like my wife, honestly. The other man nodded again. Well, the most important thing is that you're happy. The well-built clerk that had his sleeves rolled up emphasized the word happy. The tall, handsome man nodded. We can certainly agree on that point. There was an adver advertisement above them showcasing a hot spring establishment. The words, once in a lifetime prices, were floating above the steam covered scenery in a, a Bepu, Bepu Bay. An electronic voice burst out from the speakers, announcing the next stop, soon after the train began to slow down with a metallic shrill. The doors opened, and a young woman in a white shirt stepped onto the car. Her hair had been let down to one side, she held a book with, with words, How to Live, printed on it. She sat down in the seat diagonally from me, opened the book to read. Ugh. The middle-aged man in the suit left the car at the next station. 
After two more stops, I was the only one left in the car. The electronic voice announced that the next stop would be the last. I stood up and got out of the train car. So where is she? I stepped into the stone platform. It smelled like dried leaves. Cold and humid sea breeze blew up the mountain slope. I heard the rustling of grass. The station was deserted, so I walked around for a bit. I managed to make out the name of the station from the rusted, ancient-looking iron plate, but whatever was written on the backrest had faded a uh, faded plastic bench. Wait, back what what well whatever was written on the backrest of the faded plastic bench, which probably used to be blue, was completely illegible. There was no one on the wooden ticket gate either. So he's just caught a train going anywhere? I'm, s I'm sorry, could I borrow a phone? I received no reply. The area behind the ticket window is completely empty. I passed the gate and walked to the ivory public telephone spotted further away. <clears throat> are public telephones in Japan not pay phones? Or, or maybe they are. I mean, it's just courteous to ask. Oh no, that doesn't, doesn't look like a pay phone. I could hear the long blades of grass rustling in the wind outside. I checked the clock on the wall, then picked up the receiver and stuck a coin into the coin slot, and turned to dial a few times. After a few beeps, someone picked up the phone on the other end. Hello? Narasaki? Where are you right now? I'm at the station. The station? What about your car? It's close by. I wanted to take a little detour. Sachiko's voice came out a bit too loud from the receiver. I scratched my ear. I see. I see. Coming by car was a bad idea after all. Driving through the mountain roads can completely wreck your hips. When did you leave? You didn't say a word, and I was so worried. I left early in the morning. I didn't want to needlessly wake you, which is why I'm calling now. I wouldn't have minded. Being all ceremon sentiment ceremonious like that only makes it harder to say goodbye. If you say so. But just so you know, I spent the entire day looking for you. Oh, I'm sorry about that. But, but why? I didn't see you anywhere, so I got worried. I might sound weird, but I almost felt like you'd vanished into thin air or something. And then I laugh, imagining her indignant face on the other end of the line. I asked Nane about you, and she said she'd never met you. I was worried that maybe there was something wrong happening with me again. I didn't pursue the conversation, but you were staying at the mansion, right? Did you check in with Lily or something? That's right. If you don't believe me, you can ask her yourself. No, it's okay. Oh yeah, there was one thing I wanted to tell you. What? You might start forgetting things a lot for a while now. Is that related to my symptoms? Yeah, you could say it's a side effect of you getting better. It won't last for long though, so don't be worried. You just keep doing what you always have, and you'll soon forget what, I, what I, what's even bothering you. Such go made a pause, as though contemplating what I'd said. I waited for her to reply. Okay, I understand, she replied. When you say you're coming when did you say you're coming back to Tokyo? In two days. I'll be leaving at noon. Hmm. I switched the receiver to my other hand and leaned against the wall. The sound of rustling grass reached me from the other outside the station. I'll drop by your clinic when I get back. Your symptoms will probably pass by then. Talking to you seems to calm me down. Whenever you're free is fine by me. When do you think our next meeting could be? The next one, huh? There's something I want to look up when I get back, so it depends on that, I guess. Look something up. As Sachiko contemplated what I could have meant, my phone let out a clicking sound, letting me know one of my coins had just been swallowed. I'm running out of coins. Couldn't you get more somewhere around there? Unfortunately for me, I'm stuck at the ghost town of a station. Anyway, I doubt it's going to take that long, so I'll call you back tomorrow. The same black phone? Yeah, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll call the same number I'm calling now. Let's see, you can wait for my call around 5 o'clock in the evening. 5 o'clock, same phone. Gotcha. Good. But if I somehow end up not calling until it gets dark, that means something urgent came up, so you shouldn't waste too much time waiting. Okay. Thank you for everything. Don't worry about it. We're old friends, aren't we? Yeah. See you around, then. Bye! Her voice grew a bit more distant as I heard her put, up the, put the receiver down. I did the same with mine. And with that, my last coin was swallowed up. <sighs> 
So, how long is she going to linger? <laughs> Alright, chapter 7, Labyrinth. Ooh, this sounds freaky. Labyrinth, the greatest, one of the greatest and scariest trials of the Greek mythologies. There was a day at the- oh, it's Takako again! Yay! <laughs> there was a day at the top of the page I opened up the diary to. Before reading the entry, I flipped a few pages forward. The text ended after two pages. All I could see were empty ruled lines, no matter how far I went. I returned to the page with the date. There were no other dates on the following two pages, which made this fi uh, the final entry. I wonder if that means we're also getting close to the end of the story. November 3rd, 1975. We were playing in the park behind Takago's apartment when she found the ca a carcass of a turtle. Aww. She said it was a turtle that used to be hers. She got it during one of the town fairs and kept it in a big styrofoam box. I didn't recall there being a box like that on her balcony. It stood lightly tilted to the side to create different areas, one with water and one another with sand. The area with water was covered in green moss, and I occasionally spotted a goldfish swimming there too. Apparently, the turtle used to live there as well, but it kept escaping the box all the time, although it always returned in the, in the end. It's a weird turtle. However, it had been six months since its last disappearance, and Takako seemed to have forgotten all about it until now. We dug a hole under the slide and buried its withered carcass in it, using an ice cream stick as a grape marker. As we had no name written on the stick, we simply went with green turtle. The discoverer of the carcass left Takako heartbroken for a while, but she managed to cheer up eventually. We played hide and seek together. Talk, talk about nostalgic. Voicing the feelings I'd, uh, the feelings I'd always felt when reading this thing, I continued to the last page. Only the two of us could have known what happened that day. As such, only Sachiko or someone Sachiko had entrusted with this information could have written this diary. Takako is very good at hide and seek, so I could never find her. And whenever I gave up, she started talking about going home. She'd always sneak up behind me for a quick scare. I'm leaving, I said in the middle of the park in a loud voice, but nothing happened. Even after checking the tall grass where I expected her to be hiding, I couldn't see any trace of her. I glanced up at the orange sky, genuinely concerned, just leaving, and considering just leaving, but decided to look for her a bit longer. I climbed all the stairways of our apartment building. I checked all the bo booths in the public toilet of the park. I looked for her in the empty warehouse on the other side of the street. Most of the areas were locked, but I found a few doors that were open, so I had a peek. It was dark and smelled like dust inside. The entrance of the seventh warehouse container was open, too. Takako was hiding in there. That was the same area. <clears throat> that was the same area where Takako fell when we were playing tag on the roof of the warehouse. I had a landlord who worked at a nearby. Um. Oh, here we go. Okonomiyaki restaurant unlocked the door and let Takako out. It wasn't used for anything, so we did get scolded, but otherwise got off relatively easy. Takako was crouching in the corner of the room with an orange light falling from the hole in the ceiling, illuminating her vague silhouette. Found you. Let's go home. Yet she still remained crouched. When I walked closer, I found her moaning and talking to herself. Oh boy. As I touched her shoulder, she let out a scream. The tim tim timber... The... I don't know if that's supposed to be timber or not, but timber of her voice was so odd, I initially couldn't even make out her words, but then I realized she was asking me not to make a sound. Oh, the, the, the hypersensitivity. I figured I'd ask her if she wanted me to call her parents, but changed my mind. I stepped down in front of her, careful not to make a sound. Dr. Go was sitting on the ground, hugging her knees. Her eyes were narrowly open, but had been fixed on nothing. Her mouth trembled as she kept mumbling something. I reached out and covered her ears. I could feel her face flushing through my palms. As we sat like that for a while, she heard her shaking began to gradually subside. Okay, asterisk. She breathed heavily for a while, but that too eventually stopped. My hands were growing numb, but when I slightly moved them, she abruptly spoke up. Did you say something? I, I, did, oh, I, did you say something? I asked her in a low voice. She didn't scream this time, she seemed relatively calm. You want me to call someone? Don't go anywhere. I can still hear it. Don't go anywhere. I can still hear it, she said in her normal voice. Can you stay until it passes? Sure, I answered. Weird. Oof. So wait. Dang. So she must she might not have actually had a relationship with Takako. Sounds like she had these symptoms pretty early on. 
I finished the diary and laid it on the bed facing the ceiling. That's right. I knew it. Miyoko did the same thing Sachiko did when my ears started ringing. Maybe she was actually Sachiko. That vague idea had been in the back of my mind for a while now. If she was the one who wrote that diary, then it made perfect sense that the parcel that came with it had no return address. But why would she do that? Why was this happening? No matter how hard I thought about it, I couldn't come up with an answer. I feel like I've been forgetting something important. Or perhaps it was just my memory devouring illness acting up again. A headache assaulted me when I tried to focus on that corner of my mind. I shook my head absentmindedly, looking around the room. I remembered what I saw in Kozuo's room. It was definitely Sachiko in the dark cave-like place. I only saw her from behind, but I would recognize her anywhere. <gasps> and she was carrying a child! It was Sachiko on her, like, spirit journey type thing through her own mind. So Takako had, like, glimpsed that middle, like, that middle zone. But she had long hair, while Mayako was relatively short. Which meant they were two different people, after all. The more I thought about it, the more confused I got. Huh. I let out a sigh. I closed my eyes and tried remembering Sachiko's face in that darkness. But the area around her eyes remained dark, so I couldn't visualize her well. At this point, I felt like I might have been hallucinating and that, that my mind had created in response to my wish to see her again. And I, was, I opened my eyes and picked up the notebook and looked at the trace left by the pages that had been torn out. It didn't particularly stand out, but it wasn't insignificant either. I got curious about what they contained, even more so than before. Maybe they could have helped me discover who wrote the notebook. There were too many things in this sanitarium I couldn't understand. My illness, Sachiko, the phenomena in the dark room. I hoped the notebook would provide some answers, but all it did was leave me with more questions. I gave up on thinking and shoved all these thoughts into the mental, mental drawer. I began flipping through the notebook's pages again, looking at the dates. Some I had forgotten, while others were completely unfamiliar to me. But the moment I saw them, they'd reappear in my mind as a memory, and as though they were all there, uh, they were all supposed to all be there. As I traced my fingers along the letters of the text, I felt an odd kind of warmth travel through my fingertips from my head, all the way to my head. It was a pleasant feeling, all in all. The warmth in my eyes shed hot tears. Oh, Takako. I think you're about to have a mental collapse over there as well. After I calmed down a bit and sat up, I felt a pain in my shoulders. They must have gotten stiff after staying at the same spot position for too long. I climbed out of bed to stretch my limbs. Then I left the room and took a stroll around the sanatorium. The orange rays of the evening sun illuminated the corridor. Good afternoon, Takako. I turned around to see Mayoko behind me. What were you doing today? You haven't asked me to do anything, so I was reading the diary in my room. Miyoko's eyes shifted to the notebook in my hand. I see. I feel like reading that thing is all you've been doing lately. Oh, I actually just finished it earlier. Miyoko's gaze returned to me. I could feel the warmth of the orange-tinted sunlight in my skin. Did you find anything out? Miyoko asked. It helps me remember a lot of things. I feel like I have a better understanding of what kind of person I am. If it was a like in my... If it was like... If it, if it was, ugh. if I was to liken my mind to my body, I felt as though the missing limb had just been reattached, letting me move more freely. On the other hand, the limbs that were still missing stood out all the more. And now I feel lonelier than before. Hmm. In what way, exactly? Showered by the light, Miyoko made a faint smile. For example, you remember the look in your, um... <laughs> For example, you remember the look of the room you stayed in during a school trip, but not the lobby of the hotel, right? You tend to forget things that don't matter much. And even the fun memories are not necessarily replicated fully in your head. When you try to remember some of the details, you find that you simply can't. Well, that kind of loneliness, that's the kind of loneliness I feel now. Hmm. Mayoko seemed as if she had trouble following what was going on about, let on a thoughtful moan to indicate she's paying attention. <sighs> Perhaps you can't understand the feeling until you become an adult. I'm more of an adult than you. Aren't you simply going through a sentimental episode? Maybe. But I still feel like this kind of feeling gets stronger as you grow older. I see. That's possible. 
Mako's eyes wandered back to the notebook in my hands. I'd love to read that too. Would it be okay for me to borrow it? I held up the notebook. I looked at Mayuko's face, then at the notebook, then back at Mayuko. You can have it if you want, but aren't you normally busy with getting dinner ready around this time? That's right. In that case, I'll leave it I'll leave it on one of the shelves in the night duty room. Alright. Thank you. I nodded. See you later then. Mayuko continued to the kitchen. In the end, I couldn't ask her about the diary. Mayuko said she'd never seen it before, so if she really was the one who wrote it, there had to be a huge and very serious reason as to why she'd go through so much trouble to cover her tracks. Hmm. Uh, so what's gonna happen to this place? Cause we're pretty sure, we're pretty sure, right, this isn't real, right? Like, I'm so sure. I walked down the moonlit corridor, looking at the dim red glow of the emergency lights. I could hear the metal plate strike the wood pull outside. Light escaped through the gap in Sanae's door. I gave it a light knock and received a quiet response. Stepping inside, I saw Sanae reading a book at the table at the table lamp's light. Not gone to sleep yet? Hello? I wasn't feeling very sleepy, so I decided to read. What about you? Same here, except I was out talking, taking a walk. I sat down in the cane chair on her bed. I heard a wait. A weird high-pitched sound from outside that reminded me of a flute. Huh. I've been hearing that a lot in my room lately. Do you think it's a bird? It's new. New? It's a small bird, also known as a scaly thresh. I made a gesture towards the, to the rough, side, rough side with my palm. They sound like a whistle. It's kind of creepy. But it instantly becomes better when you realize it's a cute bird, no? I suppose so. I suppose so. Sanae smiled. Aren't you scared to take a walk uh, Aren't you scared to take a walk alone at night? She added. Nah. It's more exciting than during the day. I imagine you've walked past everyone's rooms. Maybe. I bet the ghosts and stories that uh, we have here all originate from you. No, oh, that's a, I bet all the ghost stories we have here all originate from you. Not at all. What do you mean? Sunai knitted her brows. I'm hungry. There's yesterday's jelly in the fr refrigerator. Can I, I, who's talking? Who's talking? I don't even know. And Takuga's probably the one who says she's hungry. She's always hungry. Can I have it? I opened the small fridge by my feet, finding a single plastic package of tangerine jelly on the top shelf. Go ahead. Thanks! I peeled off the seal with the picture of the tangerine on it, took a little wooden spoon from the package, and began eating the orange jelly. I'm guessing orange jelly as in, like, jello. Because that's what they call it in England, is they call it jelly. Because otherwise, this seems very strange. Because <laughs> I'm imagining, like, um tangerine flavored like spread that you would put on like uh, toast or in, uh, I guess if you made it really really sweet you could put it inside a pie or something not necessarily eating directly out of a package <laughs> so I'm guessing it's like American jello it was cool and had a sweet sour taste characteristic of citrus fruits you want some? if I eat that stuff at night it'll only make my stomach feel cold hmm I put a spoonful of jelly in my mouth Let's put on some music. Miyuko... Miyuko won't like it. You think she'd run all the way to your room with complaints? Now that I think about it, we don't have a single TV in this place. Yeah, now that you mention it. Not like it's something I'd use. Aren't you worried we might be missing some vital news or something? What kind, for example? I looked at their ceiling and cocked my head. Like a giant monster approaching our town, or something. <laughs> Sanai chuckled. What kind of monster? Uh, a humanoid, 15 meter tall anteater, who uses its snout to suck people straight to its belly through the windows of their houses. That would be terrifying, actually. 
I made the shadow of an ant eater with my finger in the dim light. Now I'm gonna be too afraid to go to sleep. We might be in severe danger if we miss the announcement on TV telling us to keep the lights off and not make a sound. Sound any glass at the window. These kinds of things always just appear in front of windows without warning. Then you've got to run and barricade yourself in the bathroom. Trapping yourself in a confined space in a horror movie is basically suicide. I don't think I've ever seen anyone survive that. The moment the characters begin playing, you know they're dead. There was the one movie with, a wor with worms that traumatized me. The one where they travel through pipes? That's the one. I wonder if it's referencing actual movies. There was another movie there was another movie where they had a sudden close up of a freaky alien face out of nowhere. It almost gave me a heart attack. That's the one about the alien that could split into par particles and reform, right? Yes, I'm surprised you know that. I used to watch lots of movies. Is there anything else that scared you? Hmm. T Rexes? We pretty much said that at the same time. <laughs> I can't wait to decide to take shelter there, but why do you keep sitting there without doing anything? Ah, oh, she's talking about Jurassic Park with the porta potty. <laughs> I guess the riders figured it'd be more fun that way. I suppose so. I yawned. A whiff of wind blew down, blew into the room through a partic partially open window, and opened my eyes to see the moon blur and, el and elongate in the distance. Hmm. Not planning to go to bed yet. I guess I'm starting to feel pretty sleepy. Though my legs still felt heavy as lead, I mustered enough strength to stand up. Good night. Night. I continued to the exit of the room with uncertain steps. S see you tomorrow, said Sanai as I opened the door. Yeah, see you. Thanks for the jelly. Hmm. I returned to my room and threw myself into the white bed. I wrapped the sheet around myself like a cocoon, letting my consciousness slowly melt into the world of dreams. I dreamed of seeing a 15 meter high humanoid anteater in my window that made me panic and locked myself in the bathroom. Very specific dream. Hmm. So I just had a thought. We remember now that Lily lost her friend. I wonder if her friend is one of the people here in the sanatorium. Like, could it be, um, uh, could it be Sanai? Like, I think Lily talked about her being someone who liked to read. I don't know. Sanai seems so young. Could just be the nurse. Machiko. Huh. Anyway, let's continue on. I considered falling back asleep when I opened my eyes, but the sun peeking through the gaps in my curtain shone right into my face. Oh, I hate that. No amount of twisting on the bed let me escape the brightness through my eyelids. And when I finally gave up and climbed out of bed to close the curtains, I realized I wasn't that sleepy anymore. I parted the curtains instead. A snow-laden mountain loomed beyond, my win beyond the window. Nice. Hey, I spot Kozo standing in front of the door, leading to, the, leading to the inner yard. What's up? I can't leave. Kozo turned the doorknob, but the door didn't budge. That's just, is that a, a lot of snow? What are you doing here? I came to see the snow. Well, too bad. The door doesn't open. I rolled up my sleeves. Just give me a moment with them. Kozo took a step back as I seized the doorknob. Huh! <laughs> Ooh, well, that crack reverberated in the room. Oh, don't break the door. You've broken it. It's not broken. I have to tell, I have to tell Miyako about this. Hey, wait, don't do that. <sighs> Through the window, I can see a pile of snow that would reach up to my knees right outside the door. Well, right outside the door wasn't particularly accurate as they covered the entire inner yard. Only the big camphor tree was still towering high enough, to, uh, high above it all, boasting an elegant white layer of snow on top. I guess I'll try that window. I did the latch and opened the window, only to be momentarily blinded by the brightness of the snow. Stepping on the windowsill, I jumped outside. My legs sank into the snow below. Whoa! I'm sinking here! It'd be freaking cold. I was about to jump back inside, but Kozo walked in front of the window before I knew it, blocking my way. 
Open the door. I need a shovel to clear this much snow away. You have your hands, don't you? Now that's cruel, Kozawa. Are you kidding me? Look at my legs are freezing, okay? Mayuko appeared behind Kozawa in the cor corridor. What are you two doing? We're playing in the snow. Good. Mayuko had me to shovel through the window. I was looking for you to help me with shoveling the snow. And I just happened to be looking for a shovel, too. I stuck I stuck the snow a shovel into the snow. Ugh. I lifted up the shovel full of snow and placed it on the cart behind me. Gozo appeared as well, pushing an empty cart toward me. She stopped the uh, she stopped the empty cart next to me, moved the snow filled one, and pushed it away. I continued shoveling snow until Kozo returned to the next cart. I've never thought of using a cart to shovel snow before. I usually just pile it up in the yard. Seeing that my car was already partially filled with snow, she rattled her own. Jeez, give me a break. I have some business in the library. Go ahead then, I can shovel snow by myself. <laughs> How on earth am I supposed to go? Kozo made an indignant expression. Her legs were shorter than mine by at least a hand length. I cleared half the way already. It won't take that long. If you start taking breaks, I'll talk. I'll, if you start taking breaks, it'll take until noon. She's not happy. Kozo rattled her cart again. Jeez, don't you trust me at all? I trust you about as much as I trust the paper you used for goldfish scooping. Have I done anything to you? Hmm. Why are you bringing that snow anyway? Over there, where Miyako told me. Miyako appeared on the clearing, uh, on the cleared up road as we talked. I brought you some coffee. Thanks! And some hot milk for you, Kozua. Kozua took the paper cup from Miyako. Um, where's Sane? Oh, that's what she Ah, uh, where's Sane? She seems to have woken up with a bit of a fever this morning. She's resting in her room right now. It was freezing this morning. Is she okay? It didn't look like anything serious. I finished my coffee and handed the paper cup back to Miyako. Oh yeah, listen, just listen to this, Miyako. Kozawa said she only trusted me as much as the paper used for goldfish scooping. I once caught five goldfish with a single one. <laughs> there was actually one. There's, huh, there was actually one time I almost caught twenty. Twenty? That sounds far too fishy. Is it really true? I'm not lying. Anyway, uh, that's not what I was trying to say. Can you hurry up and shovel the snow already? Goes away me on after handing a cur cup back to Miyoko. With two cups in hand, Miyoko turned around and continued to the entrance. I found some ice on the roof, so I'll go try and shatter it for now. Let's take a bath together after we finish with the snow. Oh, oh bath. That sounds so nice. Sounds great! As I resumed my work, I, realized, I suddenly realized something and turned to Kozawa. You can use the connecting corridor to go to the library, right? Borrowing the keys is too much of a pain. Seriously? <laughs> More of a pain than shoveling all the snow. Of course, that just needs to be happening, so I wouldn't complain for having your help. Those hinges squeaked as I closed it behind me. Upon entering the silent lobby, I heard the rustling of trees and the chirping of birds from outside. The light filtering in through the stained glass above the door lit up the floor. I continued forward, glancing at the astronomical the ast astronomical trinket on the counter. The plan the planet <clears throat> The planet invitations are slowly spinning in the barely perceptible breeze. Oh that that I think they're kinda cool, but I don't know what they're called. The contraption sounded out a high pitched bell like sound. I heard the sound of footsteps, and then Mayoko appeared from the stairs, leading to the underground bath. Have you fi have you finished? Where should I leave this? I held up the shovel in front of her. I took it from the storage room on the second floor. As for the cart, you can leave it in the inner yard. The cart is right by the exit right now. I see. All right. I'll go return your shovel to its place. Um, where's Kozuwa? Asked Mayoko as she was about to climb the staircase. She went to borrow some book from the library. I don't think she'll take too long. 
I'm done preparing the bath, so I'll find a change of clothes and come back. Okay! I ascended the stairs with a shovel in hand. From behind, I could hear Miyako walking to the door. Gonna go get closer, because freaking the bath sounds awesome! The storage room is located in the extra area between the stairs and the first room on the second floor. Its narrow confines had a large painting and a fancy, fr fancy frame that no one could figure out where to hang. The sofa was missing a leg, an aquarium for tropical fish, and all sorts of otherwise completely unrelated bits and bobs. In the dark room, illuminated by a single source of light, I found a stand similar to the one used for umbrellas. I promptly stuck the shovel into it. So long, partner! Till we meet again! I turned off the lights and started down the way I came, but, for, but paused in the middle of the corridor. On my right was Kosovo's old room. I placed my hand on the doorknob and slowly pushed the door open. There was only a bed, an empty cabinet, and a closed window inside. It hadn't changed at all since I'd last seen it. I could see the sky above the port town through the window. The light through the said window illuminated the room, unconcerned that its master was gone. I stepped inside and heard the floor creak underneath me. I closed my eyes but couldn't sense the hard rock floor underneath my feet, the cold wind blowing through the walls walls of the narrow cave walls, the low humming of the str strangled in my the low humming that strangled my chest, or even the smell of wet soil and moss. The bath's ready A sudden voice from behind me left me startled. I turned around to see Miyoko with a puzzled expression on her face. What are you doing in a place like this? Nothing! Huh, Miyoko let out a sigh. Let's go take that bath. I passed by Miyoko. She followed behind me. Interesting. Oh boy, the bath. <laughs> Man, bath, that's so nice. I submerged myself in the hot water while resting my head on the edge of the tub. I could hear the sounds of Mako washing her hair. I grasped the pon uh, poncon toy floating in the tub, submerged in the water, then let it go while watching the ripples it created as it shot up. I'm guessing that's the little bobbles inside. Uh, that's the other thing, is like, I have one, one sad thing, I, I probably mentioned this before, but visiting hot springs or taking baths, I always get really lightheaded if I'm in it too long, so I, I really want to go, like if I go to Japan I'm absolutely going to go to an onsen, but I'm going to be such a pathetic user of it because I'm going to have to get out in like 10-15 minutes and take breaks, because I freaking get so like, I, I don't know why, I really have no idea why, but like I just, I get hot and I just get, I get like, all sleepy and like I'm honestly worried that someday if I weren't paying attention I would actually just pass out in the bathtub and that could be dangerous. <laughs> oh Kozawa. Kozawa regarded me in silence. Once I began feeling warmer I climbed out of the bath and sat on its edge. As I counted the number of pumpkins floating in the tub, Miyoko finished washing her hair and placed her basket on the ground with a thud. I could hear wet footsteps as she walked towards the bath. The round yellow pond Ponkan sluggishly swayed in the calm water. Miyuka submerged herself up to her shoulders and shifted her gaze to me. It was getting too hot. It was getting too hot. I slid down to the edge, leaving cool air for the hot water. My skin warmed up instantly. I could feel the heat traveling through my neck and my head. If you cool yourself off at the proper intervals every time you return to the bath, it'll feel as good as your first time. And you never get too hot either. Really? I closed my eyes and my cheeks warmed up. You warm yourself in the bath and you cool down sitting on the heads. Rinse and repeat. Guess that's a guide for me! You manage the temperature of the outer layer of your skin, heating and cooling it as though you were making a mil uh, mille fuel out of yourself. I hope I read that right. It's the elegant way of enjoying a bath. You're gonna catch a cold like that! I don't think I don't think you need to worry about that. So Kozo says she stood up. Yeah, Kozo knows this is a healthy way to enjoy a bath. Oh, wait a second, I know what you did there, Kozo. I exclaimed by raising my fist. Are you are you leaving already? Kozo nodded at Mayoko's question and left the room. I spent a few moments gazing at the white vaporous cloud with clouded windows, and a cool drop of water fell on my forehead. You gotta get your hair wet. Miyako came over to me and tucked some loose uh, locks of hair peeking out from beneath my towel back under it. 
Your face is red like a boiling octopus. I may have spent too much time in the water. I think it's about time you got off then. Would you like me to wash your back? Yeah, of course. Think of it as my thanks for shoveling the snow. <laughs> I guess hard work does pay off from time to time. I got out of the bathtub, splashing hot water all around me, and sat down on the close, closest wooden stool by the shower. Mayuko brought a stool out of her own, sitting down on, to, on it behind me. Oh, convenient steam. <laughs> I like it a little rough. Understood. Mayuko covered the washcloth in soap and pressed it against my back. She took hold of my shoulder with her other hand. <laughs> Look, I know I said I wanted to be rough, but I don't want to hurt, okay? I'm just kidding. She began slowly brushing my back up and down with a tight, with just the right amount of strength. Does it hurt? No, just right. Feels good. I see. I exhaled a breath, ra raising my knees and resting my chin on them. Are you tired? Nah, it's not like that. Snow never piled up that much back where I'm from, so if anything, shoveling was a nice new experience for me. I've never seen so much snow here in the past, to be honest. Guess I won't have any more chances like that, huh? Yes, unfortunately. I see. Well, not like I'm the one concerned. Mako's hand paused as she continued to consider my words for a moment. Do you have any itchy spots? You sound like a barber. What do you want? What would you do if I said I do? I let out a laugh. Don't, bl don't blame me if you don't, if you won't be able to sleep on your back tonight. Have you ever said that I had an itchy spot at the barber's? No. I have. Miyoko let out a gasp of surprise. You actually had them scratch your head? Yeah. But then the rest of the experience didn't go too well. They totally rushed the drying part afterwards. I think they thought of me as an annoying customer and wanted to get me out as soon as possible. I've always thought it was more like a figure of speech than an actual proposal. But it felt so good. I agree. Best part of getting a haircut is, is like if you get your hair shampooed, which you don't, definitely don't need to. But it feels so good. <laughs> I, want, I want them to do it again. Well, I suppose I can see what you mean. It feels good when another person scratches you. For real. How does your back feel? Really nice. I wish we could continue this for hours. I see. After that, Miko also washed my arms and shoulders. Well, that's very kind of her. You're being awfully nice today, Miyoko. I've been nice since before I was born. I couldn't help but chuckle. Really? Oh, didn't you know? Half of me is made pu of pure, undiluted kindness. Never heard that one before. How did you find out? I got a blood test here. You can tell that from blood? Leukocytes. It's a leukocytes, hemoglobin, protein, and kindness. And in your case, kindness takes up about half of the whole? How does she know all those words? Dang. Yes. What's the average for a person? Unfortunately, I'm quite far above average. I guess I'm lucky to have a nurse like you, then. We both chuckled. The last reverberated around the bathroom walls. <sighs> Cold air enveloped my body as I opened the door to the dressing room. I glanced at the weight scales by the door. I passed them by. I took a basket with a change of clothes from the shelf, wrapped myself in the towel, and put on my underwear. As I slid into my shirt and turned around, I saw Miyako putting her socks after wiping herself with a towel. Do you always start with the socks? Yes. That looks pretty indecent. It's just kind of weird. <laughs> Miyako promptly put her underwear in her shirt. I always feel like a heap escapes my body through my feet. Okay, I can kind of, Okay, kudos. I kind of get that now. Really? And honestly, I feel the same way. I think I feel the way you think is far more indecent. Really? Well, that was interesting. <laughs> I have to agree, though. We have a lot of hardwood floors at our house, and now that's getting cold, like you can feel them. But I've noticed, like, if I go downstairs where like it's technically cold or temperature wise, but I don't feel as cold because that's carpet. Ooh, this seems ominous. Okay, we're gonna play a little longer. I think it's time. So I set up a bed and, and took a thermometer out of her mouth. 
Oh, okay, it's just a, it's just a timer thing. Go on. Okay, I want to keep going. I'm actually going to hold back, though, because I keep looking at the time. It's like, it's almost an hour, and I feel like I'm going to get sucked in. This seems really, like, important, what's happening right now. The music's on all slow, so let's maybe save this for next time. But hey, we had a lot of uh, good memories here. We got to see a lot of talk ago. I'm curious what's going to happen to this part of the world and what it really means is going on here. Ah! <laughs> but hey, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much for spending your time with me and letting me go through my paces as always it's you know it's been, it's been a blast it's important to me and i thank you for catching me in my crap this game sends me for a loop i, I i'm not always 100 percent on top of everything but i'm really curious to see what's going to happen especially because i feel like this part of this like i almost want to call it her mind palace like this part of sachiko's palace is going to collapse eventually and we're going to have to see how that plays out but oh well i could hope for the best right Sachiko's gonna find some homeostasis. She's gonna be able to like have a normal life eventually. That'd be really nice. But I don't know. I still have, like I feel like there's something in my I'm forgetting. I feel like there's some detail that I haven't quite caught on to yet that like would make this make a lot more sense. And maybe like make it more like dire or exciting or something. I I feel like there's a piece of the puzzle I'm still missing. Well, I feel like there's a lot of pieces, but I think there's a critical piece. Like I feel like there's like. There's a hole somewhere in all of this. I can't quite place it, but I feel like there's just there's something else that's happening that we haven't seen yet. Well, maybe it's going to be the secret of this, and maybe Takago's going to learn like what's going on here. What, maybe maybe we'll find out or see evidence that this is actually reality and the, the Sachiko is a fake, but I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. As always, it's a pleasure having you around the channel. It's a pleasure hearing from you guys. And... You know, let's just keep moving forward with all of these and like enjoying our stories and like I'm playing through Crystalline right now. Make sure you check it out if you haven't yet. It's really fun. Uh, it's a lot more lighthearted than a lot of the stuff we've been playing lately, so that's enjoyable. But regardless, thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you so much for joining me. And until the next video you're watching me or whatever you see me in next, I'll see you there.